Hello and welcome to On Lit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mowry of Drea Renee Knits and I'm going to try and ask, nope, no, I'm not going to ask. I'm going to answer some of the questions you asked. And today I am wearing my Straya hat. Um, this was this year's weekend knit along challenge for the spring and I am also wearing a me made outfit with the Gibson top. This is from Helen's Closet that I made out of some laundered linen from Merchant and Mills that I love. I love this color and I also made my overalls. These are the Greer jumpsuit from Hey June Handmade and that's what I'm wearing. I'll throw some links below for you and let's get to some questions. Oh first or do I want to do it last? I'll do it last. Let's start with some questions. Okay. The Weekender was my first sweater pattern and I love it so much. However, I feel like I would love it even more if the boat neck wasn't so wide and I didn't realize this preference until after I did the three needle bind off for my size and tried it on. Is there a way for me to close up some extra stitches after the fact and match the look of the inside out three needle bind off, or at least a tidy way to seam a few extra stitches on either side of the neck? How would you recommend doing that? So I was pondering this and my first thought, I think you have three options so far that I have come up with. Um, option number one, which would be the least homogenous and the most so the most noticeable but really I think you're probably like the only person that's going to notice it because nobody else is looking at the details of our sweaters and what we wear um especially our handmade items as closely as we are ourselves um so you could absolutely go in and just sew up a few stitches on either side just to kind of um make the boat neck a little smaller for your preference um and you could even think about, so typically when I see my used mattress stitch, um, I have tutorials here on my channel if you've never done it. Um, and you could try doing, um, turning it inside out and doing the mattress stitch from the inside because what that does is the seam would then be on the outside and look similar to your three needle bind off. It's not gonna match perfectly though. So that kind of would be up to you on if it's a close enough match where anybody else isn't gonna notice that difference. Um, so you can certainly try it. The nice thing is it's easy to take out if you don't like it. Um, or you could just seam however you like. So option number one was just close up a few stitches, you know, sew them up, be happy, go from there. Number two, mattress stitch from the inside so that the seams on the right side of your sweater are exposed to kind of match that three needle bind off. Number three is going to be, if you're the, a perfectionist and you're like, it needs to be perfect, <laughs> but also probably the answer you're gonna like the least and the most finicky, which would be to undo it. I mean, that's kind of the good thing about our knitting is we can take it out and make it perfect for our standards if that is what would make us the happiest. So you could absolutely um, undo your bind off on your shoulders and your neck and redo it so that it's tighter. I don't know, um, here you didn't say you had also finished the tubular bind off on the neck. We would have done that first. Jeez, it's been a while since I've knit one. Um, but yeah, either way, you're gonna have to undo some bind offs and redo them but that is the way that if you wanted it to be really, really perfect, that you would need to go back and do it that way. So um, if you did choose to do it that way, I would definitely try it on and figure out exactly how much more you would like to eat up in your bind off of that neckline to get the perfect fit for you. Because if you're gonna go through all that work, you definitely want it to be perfect the second time. Um, and there you go. My hope is, you know, I have three weekenders. <laughs> So I will also throw a, a fourth bonus option out there, which is for me, that is definitely a knit again kind of sweater because I wear them so much. Um, so 
that would be a really good note to make if you ever wanted to knit it again or boat neck sweaters in general kind of figuring out your ideal measurement for your neck opening so that it's perfect for you um and your one that's wider could also be really lovely to layer like i love to layer mine um over like a flannel in the winter and it looks quite nice with a collared shirt with that wider opening so there's a couple of ideas for you Question number two, how can I determine what weight my yarn is if I don't have the products label? I'm gonna have to go over there. Um, <laughs> I, anything worsted and thinner is always very confusing to me. Thank you, your tips and advice are always helpful and encouraging. Well, thank you. Okay, so the easiest way I think to do this which I have shown on here before, is with a yarn gauge tool. So I really love these little cards from Katrinkles. Um, they have everything like I have women's socks size chart, size chart, and little needle gauge, men's socks, a little swatchy gauge, um, but one that is very helpful for those random balls of yarn that you have kicking around in your stash, or this is also awesome for spinners, so I'm really clinking these guys around, is this little tool here. Um, and so you can just lay your yarn right across here to get an approximation of what yarn weight that yarn is. Um, so I love this little tool. It also right up here, that's a wraps per inch tool. So you can also wrap your yarn around, trying not to clank them, around this card and count how many wraps it takes. Um, and between the two, kind of find an average of what weight you think that, um, yarn is and when you count the wraps it even includes here like for instance worsted weight is about nine wraps per inch so if you had counted that your yarn wrapped around nine times to fill up that inch long space then you know that's about a worsted weight um, in general wrapping to get your wraps per inch is a very unscientific method um it's there's so, maybe unscientific isn't the way to say it, but there's so many variables. Inaccurate, there's my word. Um, because it really depends on how tight, you know, a lot of yarn has some stretch and sproing to it. So depending on how tight you wrap your yarn is gonna depend on how many wraps you fit in there and that can kind of vary wildly. So I like just laying them in these channels and I feel like that gives me a pretty nice idea of what weight yarn it is. You don't want to stretch it really taut, just gently lie, lie it, lay it in one of those little channels until you find the one that it fits best. I'll put a link um, to Katrinkles down below in the description box if you want to check them out. All right. I learned how to knit when I was a kid, mostly stockinette, garter, and my grandma's caregiver taught me how to knit lace. Now, many years later, I am adventuring myself into brioche land with the cinnabar shawl. Yay! How do you count rows in brioche? So, the good news is counting gauge in brioche is one of the easier way fabrics to count your gauge on. So, I'm just going to hold up. This is the Harlow hat, the worsted version. So, I thought that would kind of give me some plumpy stitches to show this on. So, you literally would just count your stitches one two three four five and that is your rows oh i don't have it over here oh but we can use this little guy i do have a favorite um ruler i don't even know if you can find them anymore it has like cutouts for counting gauge um if i remember i'll grab it so you guys can see which one is my favorite but so you would put your little you know, your measuring tape, your ruler, whatever you're using and just count. So for instance, this, I'll, I'll even, let's see, I am getting, obviously you do, I won't say obviously, for those, anyone who might not know, um, or to confirm for those who do know, you do want to count more than an inch. I've got a little inch square here, so that's what I'm going to count, but you do always want to count a bigger amount, like four inches is kind of standard, 10 centimeters. Um, so that if there is any variation throughout the row or round that you are um, 
getting an average instead of just a one inch, which might not be true because it's so small of a measurement. Okay, Andrea, count the stitches. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this has six rows per inch. And all I did was count those little tiny Vs. Um, and then as far as counting your stitch gauge, same deal. You basically would just count one column and then right here where it depresses, that's our pearl. So it would just be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's actually pretty simple to count gauge in brioche. I'm gonna grab that ruler um, just in case anyone's interested. I should look up and see if Kelburn Woolens still makes these. Um, I remember hunting the internet because I had seen it somewhere and I loved this one. I hadn't seen any like this before. I do see a lot out there that have a big square cut out. So take this away and it would just be a big square, four by four inch square. To be honest, the main thing I use on this is this. I just find it really easy to read my gauge. And so I do it this way for my stitches and then I turn it this way for my rows or my rounds. Where this, I feel like the fabric can kind of poof I don't know. I just, I don't want just a big area. I want this. <laughs> so I find this really, really helpful for counting my gauge. And then I would just count it in here. Um, a measuring tape also works. The thing with measuring tapes is over time they can stretch out. So that's something to keep in mind. If you've had your measuring tape for a super long time, um, you might want to check it against something that is stable, like a ruler of some type wooden ruler or something that can't stretch out and just make sure it's still accurate because over time they won't be um, and you'll need to replace it. What else was I just saying? I looked at this and got distracted. Hmm. <laughs> it left me. All right. Anyways, there is my little gauge story. What was I going to say? That's going to drive me kind of bonkers. But yeah, so <laughs> I really like this one. Um, yes, basically because it's accurate. Also, the flexibility of a cloth measuring tape that you might pull out. You know, the little ones that a lot of us have. <laughs> It's about to crap this but that's white out that sadly is broken why i'm keeping it i'm not sure um but i also i like that this is stiff that it's hard so when i lay it down on my fabric um it's not shifting around or moving at all so okay andrea move on all right mm -hmm. hmm I will try to remember to put this link into it. I'm going to leave it here in hopes that I remember. Okay. I love hearing more about your design process. Thank you for all you've shared. I'm curious what advice you would give a hopeful knitwear designer on how to start out. I have dreams, but no concrete plans about designing. And I'm curious whether it's better to jump right in, even if it means releasing only a few patterns at first in a super spread out manner, or prep multiple patterns so they can be regularly released as I continue to work ahead. It sounds like what you currently have on the needles, we won't see for months. How did you settle into your current system without being overwhelmed? Thanks for sharing so much behind the scenes with us. Um, so, so fun. I don't think I've done a design question in a while and I thought that this was a really fun one. Um, so I would say it's really so personal for you and your life and what you've got going on. You know, most people in the beginning, um, aren't going to be able to necessarily jump in and just make a, li a living wage. Like that's across a lot of jobs and certainly across creative artistic jobs. Um, so you might have another job right now that you can't leave and or whatever may impact your schedule. So um, I would do whatever you can fit into your schedule at the time that's not gonna add extra stress to your life while you try to possibly build this up as a business. And so what I did, I'll just kind of share what I did. Um, I had, I was a pastry chef and I had left my job. I had just had my first baby, my daughter, Olive Rose. And 
I was trying to do just be a stay at home mom. Um, we were on a, on a very limited income and I was kind of blessed with a pretty good napper. She would sleep a lot and I have been working my whole life, you know, not my whole life, but since I was 13, I mean, I've been working for a long time. And so I felt kind of lost in those early days, like not really knowing what to do with myself. And I really wanted to knit and knitting's not the cheapest of um, hobbies. And so I knew I couldn't really dip into our limited financial situation to buy yarn. So I was like, okay, I just want to see if I can, um, release a pattern or two that maybe in a few will buy or buy some yarn. So I did not think anything this like good for you for thinking ahead on how you might want to schedule things out. I didn't know that it would really become a business. Um, I think I was a little afraid to even hope that it could. Um, so it was just kind of like a cross my fingers. I'm just going to dip my toes in here. Um, and I do remember at the time having a goal, even if it was kind of just for me, even if my patterns didn't really sell, I was like, I just want to always have like one of my own designs on my needles at a time. Um, so I didn't really start with a release schedule. It was much more of like, okay, well, I'm going to keep knitting like I have always, you know, for many years, but I'm just going to have, because I've always juggled a couple of projects, um, but I'm just going to always have one of them be something that I came up with. And so I released a pair of mittens and that was in November of 2014. And I think I released, did I release one in December? That would be really interesting. I should go back and look and see if I ended up releasing one every month. Um, but I released one and then I released another and they did kind of start to sell. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing and so fun. And it gives me something to do while my daughter's napping and um, you know, I can contribute to our household. So I think once my pattern started selling, that's when I set the goal of, I'm gonna try and release one pattern a month. Um, I will also say I started with smaller things. I started with hats and mittens and then moved to shawls. Um, I didn't do a sweater, I think, for maybe the first year. So when you see now, I might show a sneak peek or something and it's not coming out for a few months. There's a lot of different things that are why that takes so long. Um, sometimes it is because there's a lot of grading to do if it's a sweater. Sometimes it's because I like to have my patterns test knit and I want to give my test knitters um, a decent window to knit that project in, especially bigger projects like large shawls or sweaters. Um, sometimes it's because of the yarn company I'm working with and they need more time. Uh, so there's so many factors that go into it. And then I also have set releases that I've just kind of fell into. Again, that wasn't really planned on my part, but you know, I think this will be our fifth year doing the Rhinebeck sweater. And that just sort of happened. And we had so much fun doing it that we were like, should we do it again? And so that kind of fell into place where we try to release that every July. So people have plenty of time to knit it before Rhinebeck in October. And I do, I have some set knit alongs that I try to do stuff for. So there's a lot that determines my release schedule, but roughly I do try to stick with that one pattern a month. Um, I don't think I've missed a month in years. There are times when I have multiple releases in a month, but to be honest, I don't like to do that because knitters can only knit so fast and I think it can overwhelm. Um, if I do have to do that, I try to have it be like an accessory, a sweater. You know, I don't necessarily want to release two sweaters um, close together because I, I just know people can't necessarily keep up with that. Um, so I hope that kind of gives you some ideas of what, where my schedule started and kind of how it evolved. Um, I think that for a new designer, I would recommend, honestly, again, like I, I would love to say a pattern a month has been great for me. It feels pretty doable. Um, it kind of keeps me on schedule. You know, it, it just has worked well for me. But I also think, especially now, this will be my eighth year, I think, in November, which I can't even believe. Um, 
And as I have gotten further along in this journey, one thing I just always want to protect is my creativity. And I have definitely dealt with burnout, not creative burnout, but physical um, and mental and just like health stuff. And so I think that if you right out the gate, try to have maybe a really rigid schedule, depending on your personality. That's why I'm saying it's so personal, you know, um, but I would just really try to stick with whatever will make it. What's the word I want? Whatever will give it longevity for you and nurture your creativity because um, I think creativity is always there as long as we, again, personal, personal feelings on this. Um, but as long as we don't ask too much of it, you know, like I feel like it's something we kind of have to nurture. Um, yeah. That's a great question. I hope that I kind of made sense somewhere in there and tied it all up. I'm just reskinning your question. Um, I would just jump in. I really would. That's what I did. And I feel like it worked out. <laughs> um, but if you're really organized and a planner and that kind of feeds your soul too, by all means, whatever is going to keep you from getting overwhelmed and whatever makes you feel excited, like do it. I do love, and I don't always make time for this, but I do love giving myself really dedicated like research and development and organization days where I like to have my notebook and I list out all the things I've been like, okay, these are things I really want to design that I've been thinking about. I'm going to resketch them. I'm going to kind of pop them into a calendar and see what that looks like. Um, but also I think it's good to have some fluidity in there so that if you have this like, oh, this is an amazing idea. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I want to knit it right now. That you have a little room for that in your schedule as well, because I think that is where a lot of the really amazing things come from. So, all right, next question. That's number four, right? Yep, 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 yep. Sometimes I'm afraid that I am skipping, skipping around on here, uh, but I have touched on them all. Okay, last question. Um, my question is about a swatching technique I've been noticing recently where there are yarn ends at the end of every row of the swatch. I've seen photos of these swatches both in one color and with many for color work projects. The swatches look like cute little rugs with fringe on the sides. I'm curious about the purposes for this in a swatch. I've not knit much intricate color work but can understand not being able to carry catch your yarn if the, yar if the swatch is knit flat. Are these ends loose? Is this just a looks cute thing? Curious if you've ever swatched this way and your thoughts on it. So yes, there is a very specific reason for this. So here is one of mine and I love um, how you described it like a little rug with like fringe. Um, that's such a good description. So the purpose is to, I just realized why I had those tucked up. Anyways, um, so the purpose of that is actually that when people are knitting a swatch like this, they are, they want to know what their gauge would be when knitting in the round. So when we, generally speaking, most knitters, when they work in the round, are going to have a different gauge than when they knit their work flat back and forth in rows, and even more so in color work. And so you could absolutely just knit like a tube um, but then you have this little tiny tube. So you would have to actually knit a pretty big tube if you don't want to cut it so that you can still lay it flat and get your gauge measurement. Um, so your other option could be to steek it, um, which is when you reinforce and then cut your knitting. I actually just did a steeked swatch the other day, but it is, where is that? I thought it was close by. It's not. Um, so where you could, um, cut it open and then open it up like that. Um, but another option is to carry loops as you're knitting. Instead of knitting all the way in a circle, you just carry your strand of yarn around the back and then knit across the front again. Carry a big loop, knit, carry a big loop, knit. And then when you're done, you would have all of these loops dangling in the back and you just snip them. And I must have then trimmed them because I didn't want a bunch of giant loops, but they probably started off, you know, like this long. 
So you would have a whole bunch of these going along the back there. Um, so that is why people do that. It is to mimic swatching in the round so that they can get a more accurate reading on what their gauge would be in the round versus flat. It's really, really nice too for swatching for color work because um, knitting your color work back and forth in rows, if you're not going to do that in the final project, I especially then feel like that's really going to change your gauge. Um, and some people really don't like purling color work. So that would be another reason to do that. And I am actually going to link below my friend Andrea Rangel, a fellow knitwear designer, has a really fabulous blog post about different ways to swatch in the round. Um, so I'm going to link that below in the, I'm showing I'm over here because that's where my little notes are, but it'll be down here in the description box. Um, so I'll put those down there for you just in case you want to read more about that and see visuals. I can't remember if it's videos or just pictures, um, but it's a great blog post so definitely check that out so that was the last question and now let's talk briefly on the drk spin it to knit it knit along if you get my newsletter you would have seen on tuesday of this week that i announced the next knit along thank you so much to everyone who watched my little video the other day when i came up with the idea and for all of your feedback um so it's a go we're gonna do it i am gonna kick it off with tour de fleece so let's do a couple definitions here. Knit along or a spin along is basically, it's also shortened into K-A-L, Cal or S-A-L. And all that means it's when a group of people decide to work on a similar theme or topic, something brings them together so that they all make something together. Um, this will be all virtual. Some people do it together at their local yarn store, their little knitting groups, but this will be a virtual one. It's going to be hosted over in my Ravelry group and also on Instagram. I will add that information below so you can go check out the forum or head over to Instagram to check out the hashtag. I have not done my post on Instagram yet because I need to figure out what I want my picture to be. I haven't figured that out yet. Uh, maybe by the time this is live, uh, maybe I'll get it up there. And so what else? What else did I want to define? Oh, so Tour de Fleece. Tour de Fleece is, was started, I think, in 2006 and um, by Star Athena. I hope I'm getting that right. I just heard all about it the other day. So basically, this has been going on for a long time and it is when spinners spin along with Tour de France, but they are spinning yarn instead of spinning on a bicycle. And I, every year since I became a spinner, always miss out on it. I'm generally in a spinning slump during Tour de Fleece. I don't know. It's like this weird cosmic thing that happens where I'm just not spinning a lot of yarn whenever, like every spring, early summer when that happens. And then I swear the last few days, all of a sudden I get bit by the spinning bug and all I want to do is spin. I'm like, okay, I got to fix my timing here. So this year I was thinking about it and was like, I really, really, really want to knit up a handspins weekender. And so maybe I just need to take this as like my little kick in the backside to get this going. So yeah, I decided to do it. So Tour de Fleece officially kicks off on July 1st. So that'll be our kickoff date. And but the actual knit along will go for a full year. So Tour de Fleece is three weeks. It lines up with the dates of Tour de France. And, but this to make sure that we have enough time to spin a sweater's quantity and knit a whole sweater, I gave it a year timeline. And everyone's welcome. You don't have to spin your own yarn for the sweater if you don't want to. Any knitter is very, very welcome. Um, the spinning aspect is just, uh, you know, a fun addition for anyone interested. You also do not have to spin during Tour de Fleece. Like if that doesn't fit into your schedule, that's another reason why I was like, we have a year. But for anyone else like me who just needs that little like motivational push, then I think it'll be fun to kick it off with Tour de Fleece. I will not be hosting a team. I would love to, but I am actually traveling starting Monday. I am going to be traveling for like three weeks and there's just no way. I'm during one week of it. I think it overlaps. I'm actually going to be taking a week long class and I just will not be able to moderate a group um, team thing. So I 
linked in the newsletter and over in Ravelry, I did link where you can sign up for existing teams or if you've been spinning for a long time, you might already be on a team and feel free to share what team you're on um, so that we can cheer you and your team on. I am deciding right now, my plan is to join the Hello Yarn team. Hello Yarn is an amazing fiber dyer who, this is my, probably my favorite fiber club. Their colorways are just so good. <laughs> so um, I was going through my stash. I'm gonna spin from my stash and I am really just deciding on which colorway to go with. If you couldn't tell, I really, really like blues with like some oranges in there. So I am either gonna do kind of blue this is Targi Bamboo and Tussa Silk in 801010. Or Branch and Root. I actually already have a skein of this that so this was a club color. And I already spun the one I got for the club. So and then I bought more because I was like, I love this so much I would knit a sweater out of it. I just have to decide. I spun it pretty fine. It's a three ply and it's probably a fingering weight. So I could do the weekender light. Did I say yet that we're doing the weekender? <laughs> I think I did. Um, I'm ready for my next coffee. Um, but I kind of, so again, I'm going to be on the road for most of this. So I definitely will not get very far in my spinning if I'm going to spin that fine. So I, I was, I kind of want to do the regular weekender, the worsted weight version and um, spin a little plumper. I'm also going to be spinning on my um, Louette Victoria, this little guy behind me. Um, that is my travel wheel. It only weighs eight pounds. It fits in my back. It has a backpack that I can travel with. So it'll be perfect for our trip. Or Thankfully, I'm driving. We're going on a road trip. Um, but it's a lot different than my other wheels and... I find that I prefer spinning a bit plumper on that wheel. So not sure if this is truly in the running because I don't know that I would want to spin it differently than the other skein I've already spun. And that was South American Wool Top. And then I also have All Bark No Bite, which is a Coriadale. And this colorway is amazing. But it's kind of one of those precious ones where I'm like, I don't have a lot of prep time for this and I'm not exactly sure how I want to spin this colorway. I am not decided on if I would chain ply or fractal and because it's precious I'm like this might be something I need to like think on. <laughs> so kind of blue might be the winner. Kind of blue, maybe what my weekender is going to be knit up in, which would be fun. Part of our road trip is to head to Michigan to where we're from and see my parents. And my mom now lives up on a beautiful, beautiful lake that, you know, kind of be a theme. I don't know. So anyways, that's where I'm at with spinning. But I would love to have you join for spinning or for just knitting. Love it to have you for both. Um, so I will put the links below. Definitely make sure you are signed up for the newsletter because that's a great way to get all of this information. And I think that's it. Anything else? If you do join up for the knit along, uh, there's no need to sign up for anything, but definitely start showing us your fiber or your yarn that you want to use. That's always really fun. Introduce yourself. Um, and I can't wait. I'm so excited. So, oh. Here's something I would like to ask all of you. So definitely one of the first questions that I knew I would get. So I kind of tried to like be ahead of the game and I did put a link in the forum and in the newsletter on how to estimate how much fiber to buy for sweater spinning. But I would love to hear if any of you have any tips, any stories, throw them below. Anything you've learned, let us know. Um, one, oh, what was it? I'll leave it for next time. I'll think of it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go make my coffee. I hope that you got to enjoy this with maybe a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. Maybe you're spinning or knitting. So tell me what you're making and I hope to see you back here next week. Happy knitting. <laughs>